Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's event. I would like to welcome you all for the Women's History Keynote event. Um, this year's theme is called Overcoming Adversity and um, in the spirit of our theme, we based it off of this quote um, by Henry David Theron, um, all misfortune is but a stepping stone to fortune. Um, and after the event, we'd like to um, sh have, there's a bucket in the back that has little inspirational quotes on some stones that you are welcome to take. Um, I would also like to remind everybody of the three other events for Women's History Month. Um, on Tuesday, March 26th at 7.30 in the Scott Studio Theater, there will be um, a performance for Bad Girls. And then on Wednesday, March 27th at 10 a.m., there will be um, a sermon in honor of Women's History Month. And last is um, the Tuesday, April 2nd, the 7.30 Perkins Auditorium, there will be a recital from the Women's Music Fraternity. And um, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Liz Fromgen up to introduce our speaker for the evening. Good evening. Um, I'm so excited you're all here. First of all, before I forget, my advisees, make sure you sign in with me. Um, my first year advisees, I think most of you have, but if you haven't, make sure you do. Oh, up a little bit. That? Perfect. Okay. Um, first things first. As always, let's just silence the phones now. We're good? Okay. Um, following tonight's talk, there will be a Q&A period, and then following that there will be a book signing. So if you own a copy of The World is Bigger Now and you brought it, Ms. Lee has graciously offered to sign them. Okay. We'll be down here in front afterwards. See, my book is already there. So mine will be the first one signed. I'm just letting you all know. Okay. So um, welcome. Welcome to the first Hastings College first year experience, Common Reading Presentation. Our event tonight is in conjunction with Women's History Month celebration and was made possible through funding by the Audis Lecture Series, the Departments of Communication Studies, Psychology, Languages and Literatures, Political Science, Teacher Education, the Biology, Honorary Society, Beta, 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 whew, and the Office of Academic Affairs. This year we have been examining the theme of fear from multiple disciplinary perspectives. We have thus far enjoyed lectures um, on the fear of public speaking and zombies, and we'll soon hear a lecture on the fear of athletic performance. I can't tell you how happy I am that tonight's finally here. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Ms. Lee to you. It was well over a year that I sent her an email asking if she would want to come visit us. And to my surprise and delight, less than two days later, she indicated that yes, she would love to come see us. So we've been working on this for over a year, so tonight's been a long time in the making. Our lecture tonight is entitled, The World is Bigger Now, which will take us to a place of fear in the human condition. That is the fear of the most oppressive political regime in the world, North Korea. Ms. Lee joins us currently from New York, where she just recently, in December, graduated from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. She is a South Korean-born American documentary filmmaker who was detained by the North Korean government in March 2009 after she and her colleagues crossed into North Korea without a visa. She and Laura Ling spent five months in being detained, during which time they were convicted of illegally entering North Korea and sentenced to 12 years in a labor camp. On August 4th, 2009, both young women were pardoned by the North Korean government and allowed to return to the U.S. after former U.S. President Bill Clinton traveled there to appeal personally on their behalf. Ms. Lee returned home to her friends and family, which include her husband Michael, and her daughter Hannah, who was now eight years old. She was four in the book. So I think we're going to have a good night. So please join me in welcoming Yuna Lee to the podium. Um, 
first, I want to thank Dr. Framjun for uh, taking care of all the logistics and you know make this event happen tonight. Ah, and thank you for coming. Um, it is my honor to share my story with you guys. Uh, tonight, uh, I want to talk about the debilitating power of insecurity and uh, how it can cause fear and how it stops you from living life. You know, everyone is insecure in one way or another. Um, and you know that insecurity will directly take you to your small room, not in the big world out there. And insecurity usually comes when you focus on yourself and when you worry about well, how others would think about you. I'll share with you uh, one of the first conversations I had with Liz. She asked me on email, what do you think about recording uh, your speech for YouTube? And later on, she asked me another question, uh, what are, you, are you interested in appearing on a local TV or radio? And I started to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I opened my computer up in front of me um, and stared at it. That's what I do when I'm nervous. I just read whatever is in front of me with zero comprehension. And by now, you know, my uh, student of uh, classmates kind of know that I wasn't studying hard at school at Columbia. I was just staring at my computer because I was nervous. <laughs> um, I knew exactly what I was nervous about, my accent. If you speak a foreign language, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When your second language becomes the prior language, you feel sometimes you are a middle school student or elementary school student. And the bigger problem was my thoughts often spread out like nervous system. Um, you know, like red goes around and around in maze. I, I love to do it. Um, and, but because uh, I am a producer and I, I, my job is to interview people, I know how much I love people to give me one quote, short sentence, instead of a, you know, going around and around and taking two minutes and 45 seconds to get to the point for my three minute segment. <laughs> so I started to worry about others' job too. You know, what if the producer cannot get a good quote from me? What if, if an editor can find an edit point? And I found myself that I was listing all the uh, reasons why I should not be on TV or, or radio, and even for you too. Silly, huh? Um, and I, but I could not sit there and consumed by those worries because I'm a mom. I'm, you know, I need to take care of my uh, daughter in the morning for school, and that was good. So I yelled out, oh, "Forget it, forget it." You know what? I cannot make everybody happy in this world. I cannot make every person who I meet happy. I just have to be myself. Don't worry about how I look or how I sound. So I came up with this idea. I'll do my best, and if you don't like me, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so I use that a lot when I'm nervous and when I worry about how I would appeal to other people. And so we talked about like three weeks before I came here, and she, Liz called me again, and she asked me, um, what do you want for your title? And I thought, oh, title? Oh, I want do I want something fancy title? Um, and my insecurity kicked in again, and with my perfectionist, um, and I thought about journalist. Did I work hard enough to be called, be called journalist? I'm the kind of person, do not believe that you deserve a title because you live in that, you work in that field. And, oh, you know, wait a minute, I'm a mom, and I think my daughter is pretty happy with me, I'm a good mom. But it's silly to be called, let's introduce me. Oh, here's a mom from New York to talk to you guys. <laughs> you have enough of your mom to you know, talk to you. So I said, a oh, documentary filmmaker. And there was about two seconds pause. And she goes, I meant title for your speech. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're probably thinking, what about your motto? If you, you know, don't like me, it's not, my fault. And some of you, got, you are, might think, well, your bio said you work in the industry for 10 years and you have a journalism degree from Columbia University, which is one of the best schools in the US, and are you insecure? 
simply answered yes. I deal with it every day. I fight against it every day. Like many of you deal with your own insecurity. I deal with mine and it comes and goes every day. But insecurity heightens your fear and it makes you focus on yourself and your own issues and draw you into your small world rather than putting you out there for others and being a contribu contributing part of you, this life, this world. You probably met somebody who could not stop bragging about themselves. You know, did you see my Porsche that I parked in my parking lot? You know, I got a great internship and they could not wait to hire me, they even pay me. My dad, you know, has a, a great connection to ABC. And while you're listening to them, you, feel, you become smaller and smaller and thinking, I don't have anything to sh show. But what you don't realize it is, you know why they list all those things to, to you? Because they're insecure. And you don't realize that you're comparing yourself to the person who, or one of the person who's one of the most insecure person in the world. So don't feel small in front of them. For what is it like seven minutes or eight minutes? I said word insecure probably 20 times, and this word probably sounds very negative to you, but you can turn it into positivity. It made me a good listener, it gave me understanding of marginalized people. It is important when your job is listening to somebody and tell their lives to the world. I loved telling stories of different people's lives. And it was 22 years ago I started my film school. There I met amazing group of people in their 20s. They called themselves Arirang. And they were determined to use their um, filmmaking skills of telling stories or tragedies um, of people who did not have a voice, and they wanted to give them a voice. I admired them. This is who I wanted to be. And just to give you an example where their heart hurt were, this, whenever they make more money, they would, they would put that money into their filmmaking rather than you know, going out and buy their new shoes or outfit. And to me, these were the people who had a bigger purpose in their lives. And I joined them and I made uh, my films. One of my first films was, um, was about me, a freshman who lost her identity and looking for a purpose uh, in life. And my second film was about a hard-working couple who lost their toddler son, which was based on true story. Uh, this couple did not have money to pay babysitter, so they locked this, uh, their son in the house while they were at work and house caught on fire and son could not get out. And back then in South Korea, there were hardly any public assistance for these low income families. And I believed more we pay attention to this kind of story, we can make society a better place. It, from my teenage to my uh, college year, it was the most passionate um, time in my life. I was physically and spiritually awake like you guys. I never thought that passion would go away from me. But time moved on. I finished my school and I started my career. There I worked with people in their late 20s and 30s and it was a different world. I saw nepotism, I saw competitions, and I saw my colleagues pay so much attention to themselves and their career and their success, they forgot about it, ignored the people who needed our help. I laughed at them. I scoffed at them. I did not want to be one, like one of them, but unfortunately, I did. I got caught up with my life, making money, and with being responsible for my family. I forgot about those people who did not have a voice. And I even forgot why I wanted to make film in the first place. 
I did. And like that, 10 years just passed. And it's now 2008, December. One of, uh, I was with Current TV. One of the executive producers asked me if uh, I can research about North Korean refugees living below human standards in China. I, um, at the time, I was already worked on uh, various documentaries, and they reminded me of my compassion of those people. So, but it was working on a story that that I had heard for was different, differently rewarding. And I remember how thankful I was to have that opportunity to tell the word about North Korean refugees' struggles. There were a couple of times that we, uh, the story did not make it, but I did not want to let go. Many people do not have context about what North Korean refugees are going through in China, and I wanted to um, tell this word about their struggles and I was determined to make it. So I made contact in South Korea and China and I made all the logistics. And eventually, our team for our documentary was made up of Laura Ling, who was correspondent, Michiko's executive producer and co-producer, and myself. A problem was I wore too many hats, producer, camerawoman, editor, and translator. Usually, you don't want to take that many responsibility in the production, but I did not complain. I was just so happy to be part of that story. And I was completely focusing on their issue during the process and focusing on what, how can we shed light on darkness and bring some light in, what, light in their you know, lives. So we went to South Korea first to meet, meet uh, some North Korean defectors who made it to freedom. These were the bravest people who I ever met. They risked their lives to make it to South Korea. North Koreans are usually take a long, dangerous route uh, through China and Laos. Their final destination is Thailand, where um, they're called the refugees and Thailand government usually bounce them back to South Korea. And the trip is almost 2,000 miles. And they, most of the time, they have to walk. And can you, to avoid any contact with authorities, and can you imagine that the fear they must have if they have to get on a bus or train, they can be stopped at any checkpoints? Every second must be a terrifying moment for them. And when we, um, before I, we even met them, I, already, uh, I was already wrapped up with compassion for them. And when I met with them, I, I started to have a strange experience. They shared their, their story with no emotion. It almost sounds like they were so detached, they were talking about somebody else's story. I, I started to worry, what if I cannot capture um, what they went through or what they are going through on my camera. I couldn't be connected and I was worried that my viewers couldn't be connected to them. And so we had gone to a church service for a more interviews. There are another strange scenes played in front of me. There were people on the floor, sitting on the floor, and they started crying while worship was going on. I tried to put myself in their head. Well, why are they crying? Isn't this the life that they dreamt for? Or is there resentment or gratefulness? You know, some of refugees, they did not want to be on camera. Are they worried about families back home? When it came to the word family, tear bursted. And I started crying with them. And I could not stop thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do to stop their tears? What could I do? Our next stop was China. We settled in our hotel and discussed our plans. After meeting with these North Korean uh, defectors in South Korea, we were more determined to bring these stories out to the world. Um, 
According to a source, there are 20 to 30,000 North Korean refugees in China. And they all fled their country to have a better life or of support, to support their families back home. They were free, but not completely free. They were, leave all, they were all fearful of deportation because Chinese government do not recognize them as refugees and they would crack down and capture them and send back to North Korea where they face labor camp or even execution. So when we interviewed North Korean refugees in China, we had to meet them in remote locations so we don't give away, away where they live. They were all in a hideous situation, but finding about female North Korean defector situation was just too painful. About 70% of uh, refugees, North Korean refugees in China are female. And majority of these women are sold into some kind of slavery. And if you are older, you would be sold as, an, as a bride to a poor Chinese farmer. If you are younger, you would be sold as an internet sex worker or some kind of sex worker. One of the women we met was in her early 20s. I would say at the same age, probably the same age as most of you out there. And um, she left home after having a fight with her mom, like any teenager would do. But when she arrived in China, the welcome was harsh. A guy who waited her at the border put her in a small room and handcuffed her to a heater and beat her and put her in front of a computer. There, she had to work hours on end in engaging sex talk or even undressing herself in front of a camera for a stranger. This girl, if she was born in here and worked hard to move up, she might have been going to school with you guys. She had a big dream. She wanted to go to South Korea and live like people who are on her favorite South Korean TV shows. It's rich people living a high life, a life almost certainly out of this girl's reach. And during the, uh, she was, when we met her, she was on her, her break and she was going back to work after the interview, but her attitude seemed brighter than mine. And she was content with her life, how she lived. She ate more meat at a post once a year. And she was able to see the rest of the world through her computer, through her internet. And it, I was more depressed than she was. But it seems like she accepted how she, this, is, this was her life. And that made me incredibly upset. Someone. Human, some human being out there, irresponsible ones, put this vulnerable girl in this life and took every basic human right from her. After meeting with her, we did not want to waste any minute to gather all the information to finish up our documentary. Now it's March 17th. It was our last day of filming in China. And we asked our uh, Korean Chinese guide, can you take us to the route that North Korean takes? It was Tuman River. Tuman River forms the border between North Korea and China. And it's the place where North Korean cross when they flee their country. At five in the morning, sun had not risen yet. The morning was absolutely still. The only sound I could hear was rustling forage, a forage under my feet as I walked to the riverbank. The border, we had to hurry because it wasn't safe to film in daylight when we might be seen. Our Chinese guide beckoned us to follow him, walking toward North Korea. I knew it was a risky move, but I was so intent on getting story out 
I did not focus on potential danger. We followed further all the way to North Korean riverbank. We were there about a minute or so, left quickly. When we crossed halfway, our co my co-producer Mitch shouted, soldiers, run! So I looked back. There are two North Korean soldiers in green uniform with rifle. They were chasing us very fast. We all ran as fast as we could and managed to arrive Chinese soil. That's when I saw Laura fell in front of me. I asked her, are you okay? Her answer stunned me. She said, you know, I can't feel my legs. I don't know what I was thinking, but I knew I could not leave her there alone. While I was trying to help her, we were surrounded by two North Korean soldiers in a flash. I grabbed anything that I could hold on to, but these angry North Korean soldiers were determined. They dragged us violently across the ice. Soon, Laura and I were handcuffed, blindfolded, and put in uh, the cells next to each other. In the very dark, eight by space, I felt suffocated. I sat on the wood frame that was raised about five inches from the floor, and I leaned towards the wall and pulled my both knees towards my chest and focused on what can be happen next. But surprisingly, my journalist spirit was still there with me. I was going through the checklist do I have, did I get rid of all the evidence? I got, I throw away phone and a tape that I used in China when I captured, okay, check, so and so is safe. Laura and I ate papers that had contact phone numbers and I ripped the tape ribbon to destroy the tapes. Okay, so and so is safe. I could not focus on how much danger I was in, but the North Korean the potential danger they may face because of my capture. Because of my research, because of our interviews, we knew what horrible situation they're gonna go through if uh, we reveal their identity. It's not because I, I was brave or anything, but it's because I knew that I could not live with that guilty feeling if I put someone in danger. And I try hard to remember everything that I saw to report, how it is like in North Korea, what would be in the cell if North Korean refugees are sent to a jail cell. And, uh, but Pyongyang was a different story. As interrogation started, they used Laura against me right away and I was losing my mind. It was everyday battle to survive. While I was protecting, I tried my best to protect my sources and the context, but why, and even myself. But while I was doing that, I forgot about the most two important people in my life, um, my husband and my daughter. It didn't even hit me over a month that I wasn't trying hard to save myself or cooperating enough to, for me to go home. So not giving them enough details or not giving them the information they wanted eventually put me in the situation that they called me a liar. Everything fell onto me and became my fault. Filming, the logistics and story, everything. Laura and I, being in North Korea, everything was my fault. I didn't know what to do anymore. I didn't know if what I'm doing was saving our context, or me, or my family. I wanted to convince my interrogator that I was cooperating, but he always come back with more information and yelled at me. And it was like a psychological battle for two months. And I had lost 17 pounds for two months. According to my husband, I did not have that weight loss. And 
I was in the darkness for a long time, but very often the interrogator, Officer Lee, said, you know what, there is always light at the end of the tunnel. Did he want to encourage me? Did he have sympathy for me and my family? Paradoxically, I built odd friendship with him after the interrogation was over. Sure, he was a very cold, scary interrogator. But at the same time, he was a father to two children. And he was a, a husband to his wife. He was a man who was interested in American life. I'm so proud of his knowledge of books and culture. I thought one day if we could have been friends if we did not meet under these circumstances or if we are not from the two different ideologies. But at the same time, I could not forget, completely forget about my situation. I was a kid growing up in South Korea during the Cold War. Some of you, probably professors, understand the time. During the Cold War, there were a lot of propaganda thrown around from uh, both from the US and USSR, and it was much different in South Korea. I remember singing a jump prof song about defeating evil North Korean, and I grew up watching a cartoon about a Korean, South Korean hero fight against red, giant red pig, which was representing its leader at the time. And here I was dealing with the giant red pig firsthand. And whatever fear that I grew up about this country, I had to deal with it, face it. But I knew fearing them would give more authority over me. And I didn't want them to see that I was afraid of them. But at the same time, I didn't want to see them as an enemy because we have two, two different ideologies. But what goes around and comes around? If you don't want them to see me as an enemy, I should not see them as an enemy either. And the office, Officer Lee, whenever he had a chance, he wanted to show me the beautiful side of North Korea. I tried to remove my filter and try to see from his point of view. And um, I, I was, and it occurred to me and him that we were all Korean living in a divided country. Um, I remember seeing, uh, watching a new segment one night. Um, it was about old lady and her family. She was blind and she opened her eyes after receiving a special drink from their leader, Kim jong il at the time. Um, she helped her grandchild prepping for school in the morning, but I could see that she did not have her, her eyesight back. You shocked that this is a new segment. Um, it did not make me laugh. It made me sad. These people live with fear of telling the truth. And even intelligent person like Officer Lee, either he really believe, believed what he saw was true or he wanted to believe it was true. I thought the unification may take longer than some people say. You know why I thought that way? Because of the fear they have, North Koreans have, we stop them to fight for themselves. Do you remember each revolution that overthrew Mubarak government? It was possible because of collective voice. When one was in fear, the other joined to support. It seemed impossible to see that in North Korea. Everyone was watching everyone. I had two female guards in where I stayed 24 seven. And younger guard one day, she expressed honest her feeling about uh, the new North Korean TV shows, the style it was absolute compared to Chinese TV show that they watched on weekends. What, why, why is it wrong? But she, older guards scolded her right away because it was expression of degrading North Korean's product. And she got in trouble. I think that incident was reported. She was lectured again by Officer Lee. And this girl, young, girl, young guard, was uh, less cautious about expressing herself, and she was in trouble very often. But at the same time, these were the 
girls who were in their early 20s. They loved to talk about makeup, hair, and clothes. You know, every morning they spend like 30 to 40 minutes putting makeup on. And they were, uh, sometimes they were interested in um, date night in America. They asked me, oh, is that really one night stand? <laughs> I said, I think so. And they would be like, ooh, you know. That, that was their reaction, cute, right? But conversation wasn't just conversation. Every movement, every gesture, every word we share, they wrote down on their daily log. And I also used it as a, use it to analyze my situation as well as their lives. Um, one day, an uh, older girl uh, brought a new bra she purchased. I asked her how much that cost, and she said it's 4,000 Korean won. I knew that these girls were not just regular guards because the average North Korean makes around 4,000, 3 to 4,000 won a month. Um, What was there? Oh, the new thing that I, to me was, this course was, this course loved learning English. That was new to me, because during the Cold War, uh, North Korea promoted Russian to people to learn as a second language, because they hate us, right? Um, but this course had a Korean English dictionary that was uh, published in South Korea, uh, and that reminded me of my high school years. And they carried a small pocket conversation books and encouraged each other to study. And younger um, guards, she loved to sing um, the Titanic theme song. <laughs> she had a beautiful voice with a horrible accent. <laughs> but she, but she, she was a beautiful singer, yeah. Um, The older guard's dream was being a translator. She goes, you know, you guys always talk about ugly side of our country. I want to be a translator and tell world that how beautiful my country is. Maybe, maybe I didn't see what she saw. But until we close that gap, it will be hard to sit at, a ta at the table to resolve our matters. You know, the letters, your letters, phone call from my families, really kept me going. But it, my days got harder and harder after the uh, trial. A new guard came in and they were so mean. And there was a building manager who smiled all the time. And just seeing her gave me huge relief. I nicknamed her Sunshine. She, <laughs> She didn't say much, but she always smiled. And, and it kept me going one more day when everybody tra treated me like convicted criminal. And maybe she wasn't smiling at me. Maybe she just had a smile on her face every day. But her that small gesture, without her knowing it, brightened my day so many times. And I know I can do the same by reaching my hand out with my documentary, especially for the people who do not have a voice. The decision I made on March 17th, 2009, changed my life. Some criticized me. How could you make that decision as a mom? I made that decision because the girl who we met in China, I believed she has the right to live the life that my daughter has. I believe every human being deserves basic human rights. Yes, I, my fear was still there for a long time, and it makes me insecure in various ways, and it comes back and goes. But I'm not going to hide from it. I'm going to embrace it. You know, many of you just started college, and some of you are ready to go out there and face the world. A new life brings much excitement as well as fear, but that's all good. You have those two feelings because you're alive. And just tell yourself, let's face it. 
Let's enjoy it. And when you face the fear, you will realize how small that is and how it can become big when you run away from it. And I hope once a day we stop, we all stop thinking about focusing on ourselves and think about what can I do to help others. Thank you very much. Hey, Tyler. There we go. Thank you. Um, we have time for questions, and I know that there are some questions. Hi, Yuna. Hello. Um, I was curious of whatever happened to the guide. Do you know anything about that? You mean uh, the Korean Chinese guy? Mm -hmm. He was jailed in China uh, about eight months, and then he was released. And I think he tried to contact me um, afterwards, but I told him that I have no ill feeling towards him, that, and, and we haven't talked since then. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, in your book, you talk a lot about how you were you would reflect on God and how you would and your relationship with with God. How? much has it really changed you and spread on to your life today, that whole experience and that relationship shift? Huh. I, I, I hope I can say that my faith is very strong and, you know, it's, uh, it hasn't changed it. But, you know, dealing with uh, my life, I... Honestly, I often forget about him, and then comes, you know, comes back to him. But I know that he, what I know is he is always there. Even when I don't acknowledge him, he's there, his presence. And um, I try to live and follow his word. Um, the documentary that you were putting together when you were caught, did that ever like make it out? Did that get put together into film or uh, how did that end up? We, we thought about making it, including our stories, but then I thought the story was told a bigger way than what I could have done because of people who supported us. So we decided not to do it, but at the same time I felt you know, I promised these North Korean uh, refugees who we met um, that I would tell their stories. So that's why, um, you know, I devoted one chapter in my book about their situation. Would you ever let your daughter do something like you did? What? Like, would you ever let your daughter, like, go study something like you did? Um, I would be very nervous <laughs> because of my experience. But if uh, she believes that, that's the uh, that's purpose of her life, yes, I have to. Um, would you say, because of globalization and within our world and how we are, are bridging gaps between societies, do you think that 
Um, the United States and other countries as well are doing more or less to help bridge those gaps and emphasizing different cultures and learning, or do you think that's not necessarily happening as well as it should be? Hmm. I don't know if I um, got your question right. I mean, you mean in terms of uh, the relationship with North Korea and America, or? Well, just the, the relationships in general between, say, our fears. If we fear, say, North Korea as American citizens, or fear uh, Arabs for the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, do you think that we're educating our, our children and future generations more about the positive uh, aspects of different cultures to try to bridge those gaps to help a healing process and understanding like you did in your in your experience in North Korea or you know apparently what you read on newspaper about those countries it, we are I don't think government is intentionally you know doing their end to uh, make the gap but what you what you hear about those countries it's hard to um, close the gaps and uh, hard to Build trust, right, between those countries. Um, and what's what's your major? What are you majoring? I'm in a national studies major. I'm heading to Russia for a year next year. Awesome. Maybe that's uh, you know you can do. It. Everyone is, I believe, ambassador yourself when you go out there, when you go to um, country, other countries, and um, I hope you can, you know, bridge that gap. You know. You can be the bridge, you know, your work can be the bridge in the future. What was the most surprising thing that happened to you when you were captured in North Korea? I think I wrote in my book that, you know, as I told you, they were enemy to me. Um, I grew up, in North, grew up in South Korea, and I taught propaganda toward, uh, towards North Korea. But when I captured, I didn't have my coat with me because I left it on the ice at the river. And one of the guys brought me an army coat for me to wear. It was very cold at the time. And uh, to me, that was, uh, um, that was something that uh, was most surprising. Um, Thing that I faced at first because I thought they would do hit me or you know throw me to some room. That's what I expected, but instead they gave me a coat to keep myself warm. Um, what did you gain while being in North Korea? I didn't hear you, Kishan, sorry. What did you gain while being in North Korea? What did I gain? Yeah, like knowledge or anything. As my book title says, you know, my world became bigger. It doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that like I do more work. It means my world view, it, I broadened my view of world. So I care about, you know, before I work on the North Korean refugee situation, even though they were, were same Koreans, they were so distant from me. But now I have, you know, one more group of people to care about. And that's, I think, what I gained. If you had another chance to do this story, would you do it again? You mean about North Korean refugees? Yeah. Mm, I. Do not think I'm ready yet, but someday, yes, yes. But I'm probably gonna do more about their lives in South Korea because uh, a lot of them actually are going through a hard life in South Korea. And some of them went back to North Korea after settled in South Korea. When you were initially being captured, what like was going through your mind that you felt like you needed to get rid of the evidence and everything before like running and trying to save your own life? I I was surprised myself. I you know I get very scared of little bugs, and <laughs> I know that's funny, but I was very calm at the time. I don't know maybe maybe human being when you are put in that situation you become calm. I don't. I was very surprised that I was able to be calm and then get rid of you know 
I was able to focus that let's get rid of this evidence and and yeah. Have you and Laura stayed friends? <laughs> yeah, we are. And now we are both our moms. So <laughs> there are more to talk about. In dealing so closely with North Korea, and now in a time when we receive a lot of information that's not very favorable uh, seeming toward them, is it conflicting to hear that information? Has it put a different lens or filter in the way you view the information that we get about North Korea? No, it, uh, it doesn't mean that what, you know, I never denied that what North Korean government was doing is just provocative. They have been doing that, and, and I don't think that's a way to make conversation. If they really want to uh, talk to us, they need to take a, a positive step, not being very provocative. And my view hasn't been changed. What I'm saying is my view changed about the people. The government is government, people are people. And you know, we often think when we talk about um, Iraqi government and we think about all Iraqis are well, when we talk about North Korean government, they are bad, but these are you know people like us, and a lot of them really have nothing to do with the decision, right? The government make. In the book, you talk a lot about the accommodations as a prisoner, and those were not what we would expect mm. for the prisoner. And my question is really if maybe you wonder if they were never going to send you to the work camp anyway, because you, when, the, when the doctor saw you and said you were not healthy enough to go, mm -hmm. why didn't they take Laura? Why did they let her wait as well? No, they did. They did uh, wait as well. And actually, Laura, I think she has ulcer, so she had a, a worse situation. And I was trying to find like whatever excuse that so I, I don't, I'm not going to be sent to the prison like I have arthritis. I told him, like, I don't think my finger's going to be functional right, and it's just being silly that way. But I think there were, worse, it wasn't a prison, but there were some discussion that they, was, they were going to send us some remote locations because officially told me that, you know, you'll be sent to somewhere, but maybe, maybe you can, we can send you with Laura. And even though I wanted to see her so badly, I did not want to be moved from there because it means no one's going to know where I would be. And I, yeah, I, I thought I would give up to seeing her and rather than, you know, go, be moved, yeah. I have to ask this because nobody else has. Of course, the most recent thing that has brought North Korea <laughs> into the news is this whole Dennis Rodman thing. And I was really curious when it first sort of exploded all over the news, when you came here, what you would have to say about the sort of both the absurdity, but also maybe the potential for just educating people on North Korea because it's back in the news for this when it should be back in the news for nuclear issues, for other political things, but it's in the news because of Dennis Rodman. Um, what, what goes through your mind when this kind of thing brings something, you know, brings North Korea back on the, onto the media map? The first thing in my mind was, really? Him? <laughs> <laughs> He's the first American meeting its leader, Kim Jong-un. I think it, what it did was it definitely brought a different portrayal uh, of the country. Um, you know, we all knew about nuclear tests, the country like sanctions, UN sanctions, but now you know you see different picture of the country, and I think it loosened some tension uh, that people we had have had. 
but not it did not really change the government's view or anything. You know, the relation did not make any. Um, for, it, it, it's not gonna make any further step uh, from his visit. He's not, you know, like John Kerry said, he's not a diplomat. You know. Since the uh, U.S. government and North Korean government do not have any diplomatic relations, why do you think they let so many letters come and go between you and people in the United States? Uh, they could have made it much worse in that way. What do you think the reason was that they had let you communicate so much and receive so much information from home? If, um, I was actually very surprised that they, um, um, they gave us letters. And I think there was a real, little bit of resistance um, at the beginning of the capture. Uh, they kept a lot of stuff from us, even though um, my family and Laura's family are sending stuff to us, they were not coming to us right away. But they signed the Geneva Convention Treaty, so they had to just follow to, to that. And I had a Swedish ambassador uh, allowed him to visit us too. Any other questions? Anybody have to have the last word? Going once? <laughs> Twice? Three times? Thank you. Thank you guys. And grab a rock on the way out. <laughs>